Are we ready? Mm -hmm. I guess, Senator, tell us uh, how the meeting went and the future of uh, Dias. Sure. It's great to be back in Abilene. I just had a terrific lunch meeting with the Military Affairs Committee talking about Dias, what an incredible jewel it is to the American military system, to the Air Force in particular, to the ability to project power to our bombing mission and our support mission, airlift and, and bombing. Uh, I am a, a champion for Dias. Uh, and, and let me say the community in Abilene does such a tremendous job of supporting the airmen at Dias, supporting the base uh, with love, with commitment, with resources, with support, uh, and with advocacy. And, and in the nine years I've been in the Senate, uh, I have fought for Dias regularly, particularly on the Senate Armed Services Committee. And, and fighting to ensure that the needs of Dias and the needs of bases we have across the state of Texas are taken care of and are prioritized. So in the most recent version of the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, there are two different amendments included in the Senate NDAA, uh, both of which I authored, both of which are focused very directly on Dias and, and ensuring that it remains the, the premier bomber base in our system. The Air Force is transitioning from the V-1 to the V-21. That's a transition that, that is important. It's going to take time. It's going to add significant capacity, but it also adds some, some uncertainty. And so what I'm focused on is making sure we see a continuity of mission at Dias as we make that transition, and that we see Dias remain the premier bombing base in the Air Force, both with the V-1 and then as the V-1 is phased out with the V-21. What are you seeing as far as a timeline with the B-21, and, and what do you think that'll do to change the economic landscape around Abilene? Will it just continue to, to thrive because of it? Well, look, the, the timing of the B-21 is something that has proved fluid and, and not clear, clearly able to be predicted with, with certainty. My focus when it comes to Dias is, is that we ensure that the B-1 remains fully invested and fully manned unless and until the B-21 takes over. And so the two amendments that I added to this year's NDAA, one requires that the, that the Air Force not reduce the B-1 any further until those planes are replaced by B-21 bombers, so that Dias has a continuity. Secondly, uh, was another amendment that directed the Department of Defense to study and lay out a plan to maintain at least 225 bombers across the fleet through 2050 and beyond. And both of those are directed at ensuring that, that the strength that is Dias and the advantages we have at Dias between experienced airmen, between a local community that's supported, between clear and wide open skies that, that are perfectly suited for training, uh, all of that is valuable and those are resources that should be protected. Also in the meeting we discussed challenges facing this country. We spent a lot of time talking about Afghanistan. And I will say the last couple of weeks have been very difficult uh, for Americans across our country. Uh, it has been horrifying to watch the catastrophe unfold in Afghanistan. And this didn't have to happen. Unfortunately, the disaster of Afghanistan was a product of two things. Number one, the radical ideology of the Biden administration. And number two, manifest incompetence. On the ideology front, I've had multiple conference calls in the past couple of weeks with the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. On those calls, they've discussed what they characterized as the steps that the Taliban needs to take to be welcomed into the community of civilized nations. I, I got to tell you, I laughed out loud when I heard them say that. The Taliban doesn't want to be welcomed into the community of civilized nations. They are vicious terrorists who want to kill us. And this administration is hopelessly naive if they believe otherwise. But secondly, incompetence. The drawdown, and listen, I'm one who believes it was time to come home from Afghanistan, that 20 years was long enough that we shouldn't be engaged in forever wars. 
But the fact that we should come home doesn't mean you do so in an incompetent way that leaves havoc and disaster behind you. The Biden administration had no plan to evacuate the thousands of Americans in Afghanistan. They had no plan to evacuate the tens of thousands of Afghans who had assisted the U.S. military over the past two decades. And there are at least two decisions they made that were utterly indefensible. Number one, they abandoned the Bagram airfield. Bagram is a secure military base. We put over a billion dollars building Bagram. It has two world-class runways. I've been there on the Bagram airfield. Just over a month ago, a month ago President Biden abandoned Bagram. Literally in the dead of night. Everyone went to sleep. The Afghans woke up. They looked around and said, where are the Americans? And we were simply gone. The Taliban has come in and taken over Bagram. And the consequence of surrendering Bagram to the Taliban was that when we were engaged in the evacuation, we were forced to go to the Kabul International Airport a commercial airport in a dense urban environment and an urban environment that was controlled by the Taliban. It would have been much, much safer to evacuate the Americans and our allies from Bagram with two secure airstrips with a perimeter designed to withstand attacks rather than forcing everyone to go to a dangerous environment at the Kabul airport. Last week, everyone was horrified at the suicide bombings that took the lives of 13 servicemen and women. 11 Marines, one soldier, one sailor. Those servicemen and women didn't have to die. And if the evacuation had been conducted at Bagram, the odds are much higher that either the attack wouldn't have happened, or if it had happened, that its consequences would have been much, much less severe. Bagram was designed to be in a hostile threat environment. It had a secure perimeter. It was designed to withstand exactly this kind of attack. And by giving it up, President Biden forced our servicemen and women to be in a far more vulnerable position at a commercial airport. That was an indefensible decision. A second decision that may have occurred, multiple news outlets have reported that the Biden administration gave the Taliban a list of Americans we wanted to evacuate and of Afghans we wanted to evacuate. To the best of my knowledge, the Biden administration has neither confirmed nor denied that report. I hope it's not true. Because if it is true, it's an illustration of that ideological extremism and naivete that if President Biden gave the Taliban a list of Americans, and even worse, a list of Afghans who we say were really helpful to us, it's hard to imagine that list being anything other than a kill list for the Taliban now to go down that list and target each and every name that was on that list. Several weeks ago, President Biden promised the American people, we will get the Americans out. Joe Biden broke that promise. Hundreds of Americans have been left behind. America doesn't leave Americans behind enemy lines. I believe we should have stayed. We should have devoted the forces and resources necessary to evacuate every single American who wanted to come home. And the consequences of Joe Biden's total surrender to the Taliban. Right now, the Taliban is flying their flag over the U.S. Embassy. They control the Bagram airfield. They're flying Black Hawk helicopters from the U.S. military. They're carrying American Army machine guns. They have night vision goggles from the U.S. military. This disaster will not only continue to cost American lives, but it emboldens our enemies. Every enemy of America is emboldened. Putin is emboldened. She is emboldened. The consequences of Joe Biden's disastrous failure in Afghanistan are that our enemies are far more likely to engage in military aggression. Tragically, I think the odds of communist China launching an amphibious assault on Taiwan have increased tenfold in the last couple of weeks. Because as she is watching what has happened in Afghanistan, the judgment she is no doubt making is that Joe Biden is not up to the task and will not do anything significant 
to prevent Chinese military aggression. That makes the lives of Americans far more vulnerable. That makes the world much more dangerous. We're going to get going, guys. Thank you. That's all the time we have. Or, or Congress or congressional hearings or anything coming up to this? So I don't think there will be impeachment hearings in Congress because Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are entirely committed to protecting Joe Biden politically. And, and part of what was so frustrating about this disaster is it was driven entirely by politics. Biden wanted to give a speech on September 11th. And so he ordered the military, evacuate because of my political deadline and the danger to Americans in Afghanistan didn't change that political deadline. The danger to our servicemen and women didn't change that political deadline. And Pelosi and Schumer are devoted politically to defending this administration. I do think we'll have hearings in Congress about the disaster in Afghanistan. I think it's impossible to avoid those hearings. And you may see, last week we saw the administration starting to float some trial balloons that the Secretary of Defense or the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff might be fired. I think those trial balloons were largely directed at trying to insulate the political decision makers in the White House. Because it's the political decision makers in the White House who it appears were driving the train and, and who bear the ultimate responsibility. Let me say one other thing. My top priority in the Senate is jobs, security, and freedom. Jobs for the people of Texas, the number one priority of the men and women in Abilene and West Texas across our state is jobs. We want more jobs, we want higher wages, we want more opportunity. The way you get those jobs are through low taxes and low regulations creating an environment where small businesses can prosper. So every day I'm fighting to defend jobs in West Texas. As for security, it's the government's responsibility to protect us, to protect us from terrorists abroad, to protect us from violence here at home. The radical democratic agendas of open borders and abolishing the police are profoundly jeopardizing the safety of our families and communities. I just spent two days on a southern border tour, going up and down South Texas and seeing the utter chaos as we have the worst rate of illegal immigration in 21 years. We have an immigration crisis caused by Joe Biden, political decisions by Joe Biden, and, and, and there's an odd parallel between the disaster on our southern border and the disaster in Afghanistan. Both were caused by a combination of ideological extremism and manifest incompetence. On the southern border, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have handed the agenda over to the open border radicals in their party. In just seven months, we've seen over one million illegal immigrants crossing the border. We're on, on pace to have more than two million cross this year the highest rate of illegal immigration in 21 years. Yesterday at the Donna Tent facility, the Biden cages where thousands upon thousands of children are in cages, the rate of COVID positivity was 22%. That was yesterday. And the Biden administration continues releasing illegal immigrants who are COVID positive into Texas communities. This is a radical agenda that is jeopardizing our safety and security, and on our southern border we have a national security crisis, we have a public health crisis, and we have a humanitarian crisis as so many of these children, so many of these women are being physically abused and sexually abused by the human traffickers who are making billions of dollars because of Joe Biden's open border policies. All right, what thank about, you. What about the okay. planes that are coming into Abilene full, with, with, from ICE with immigrants? Uh, look, it is right now today, the Biden administration is the last mile in the human trafficking networks. And so if you go down to the Rio Grande Valley, I was in the Rio Grande Valley yesterday, you just see caravans of people. And by the way, they don't have to be apprehended. They go seek out the Border Patrol agent. And they come with a phone number, they come with a name, and they turn themselves in. And within days, the Biden administration puts them on a plane and flies them all over the country to Abilene or anywhere else. And one of the consequences to understand 
There is total operational control of the border on the southern side. The cartels have 100% control of the border. Nobody crosses the border without paying the cartels. If you're in Mexico and you try to swim the Rio Grande, they'll kill you. Everyone who crosses the border has to pay the human traffickers. Traffickers charge anywhere from $3,000 a person to as much as $8,000 a person. One of the things we saw on this border tour was the traffickers are now putting colored wristbands around the illegal immigrants. The colors correspond to how much money they pay and how many more thousands of dollars they owe. And many of these people are then getting put in stash houses in cities all over the country where they're working to pay off their debt to the cartel. So they have to live at the stash house. The cartel then charges them for rent charges them for food, charges them for electricity, charges them for everything, and it is indentured servitude, where they keep a ledger and the amount they owe keeps going up and up and up. We were told if an illegal immigrant has an ankle bracelet that ICE has given them, the cartels charge $30 for the scissors to cut the ankle bracelet off. And so you end up with illegal immigrants who spend two, three, four, five years working in slavery in these stash houses for the cartels. Many of them, particularly the women, are forced into sexual slavery, forced into prostitution. So you have a 15, 16 year old girl from Central America who wants to come to America, wants to come to the promised land, is seeking freedom, and she gets trapped where she's forced into sexual slavery and the cartel knows her family. And so this 15 year old girl is facing a choice, either accept my new life enforce prostitution for the cartels or they'll kill my parents. The open border advocates that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have empowered, they say their policy is humane and compassionate. Well, nobody who has seen the children being abused by these violent criminals can think for a moment it is anything but barbaric and inhumane. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.